Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a lesson about creating Active Directory objects. In this lesson, we're going to go ahead and start off by talking about what's going on in Globomantics and why we need to create some Active Directory objects for them. Then we'll go through and review something called organizational units, which we talked about in a previous lesson. And then I'll talk to you about three other types of objects called users, groups, and computers. And then we're going to go in and actually add the objects into Active Directory. And I'm going to show you four different ways to do it. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about Globalmantics. Well, now they have created their initial Active Directory domain, right? We've created the forest root domain called globalmantics.local. But the problem is, is, well, it's just kind of sitting there doing nothing. It's not really usable. So in this lesson, we're going to learn about the different types of Active Directory objects. Okay, again, organizational units, users, groups, computers. And I'm going to show you how to create them. And then we're going to go in and actually create a bunch of objects for Globomantics. And to be more specific, I just want to remind you that for right now, we are focusing on the New York office. Okay, I know Global Mantics is a worldwide organization, but we have to take things one step at a time. So in New York, you can see we have six servers, we have 500 Windows 7 clients, and to go with those clients, we have 500 users. So we're going to go ahead and see how to create the objects to populate the Active Directory domain for the New York office. So first of all, just a quick review about organizational units or what's sometimes just referred to as OUs. Everything in Active Directory is an object. So even though I'm going to talk to you about the creation of certain types of objects, everything in Active Directory is truly an object. An organizational unit is a container for these objects. Now in, in addition to OUs, there are also certain built-in containers and I'm going to show you these when we go into the operating system. Now OUs serve three main purposes. One is to just plain and simple keep your objects organized. All right. If we're going to have a whole bunch of users and a whole bunch of computers and the users will become members of groups and all kinds of fun stuff, well we need to keep our stuff organized and the OUs will create this organized hierarchical structure. That's primarily where our focus is going to be in this lesson. Two other purposes to OUs is to delegate administrative permissions, which there is a separate lesson for. And then a third purpose is for the managing of group policy application, which we again are going to have a separate lesson specifically to talk about that. So for right now, I just want you to keep in mind that we're just going to talk about organizational units in this lesson for the purposes of, well, being organized. Now there are three other types of objects that we're going to be working with in this lesson, and they are user objects, group objects, and computer objects. Now user objects are a representation of actual people using your network and accessing resources. So what that means is for every employee in the Global Mantics Corporation who's going to be operating within the domain, well, we have to have a user object to represent that employee. We use these user objects to control access to our resources. Okay, this is how we have the ability to say that you, a specific user, can or cannot access a resource. Okay, so if you as a person needs to access some documents that are in a folder out on our network, the only way I can control what you, the person, can get to is by creating a user object that only you, the person, will have access to and then control access to the resources based upon that user object. Now, that must have sound like a bunch of double talk. <laughs> so don't worry about that for right now. When we get in, we start creating this stuff. And as we go through the rest of the lessons and I start showing you how to grant permissions to resources and things like that, this will all make sense. 
Group objects are used to simplify the process of controlling access to resources. In other words, what I was just talking about as far as where we go ahead and control access to resources based upon the user objects, well, the problem is, is when you have a lot of users, this can get quite crazy. If I have to, one user at a time, go through and grant access and deny access to certain resources, it would just take forever. It'd be a full-time job doing nothing but that. So what we do is we take users with similar needs, or so users who have to have access to the same resources, well, they are made to be a member of a group. Then what we do is we grant access to those resources to the group, and then that access is inherited to all users who are a member of that group. So that's how we can simplify this process. If we have 50 users who all work in a certain department and they all need the same level of access to the same stuff, well, I put all 50 users into one group and then grant the appropriate access to that group. Now, computer objects, real simple, are a representation of the physical computers used on your network. Why do we have computer objects? One real simple reason, auditing. In order to keep track of what's taking place and from where, we need to have a way of authenticating the computer that things are being done on. Now, believe it or not, computers, just like users, computer objects do have not only a name, but a password. But you, the user, don't have to know about the password. Only the computer itself needs to know it. And it coordinates the authentication using that password with Active Directory all on its own. But that's what a computer object is. It represents a physical computer. And it's used so that we can have an audit record of where things are actually happening on our network. So this means it's time to now start adding some of these user, group, and computer objects into Active Directory. And I'm gonna show you four different ways to do this. One way, which is probably the most common way, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, would be through the MMC, the Microsoft Management Council, which the council in particular that I'm referring to is Active Directory Users and Computers. That's the name of the actual utility. But I'm gonna also show you how to use a command line tool called dsadd. I'm gonna show you how to, using the dsadd command, putting it into a script file can create a lot of users all at once, or really I shouldn't even say users, that is the object I'll probably show you, but create a lot of a particular object through a script. And speaking of creating a lot of a certain object, we'll take a look at a couple of mass import export tools called CSVDE and LDIFTE. It's L-D-I-F-D-E, but I like to say LDIFTE. It's just a lot more fun. So I'm gonna show you how to do all of that. So let's go ahead and switch over to New York Client 1. Okay, that's our Windows 7 client. And you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, wait a minute, why are we switching over to a client? Well, you may recall in the last lesson, we set up remote management. So I wanna show you, just like you would do in a real production environment, how you don't have to go over to the physical server itself. You can sit at a client computer and remotely perform all of the different tasks that I'm gonna show you. Okay, so here we are over on our Windows 7 client computer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and double click on my remote desktop connection icon to connect to New York DC1. Now the reason I'm connecting to New York DC1 is because that is one of our domain controllers. Now I could have just as easily connected to New York DC2. It really doesn't matter, okay? We work in a multi-master configuration in Active Directory, which means I can go to any domain controller and make changes to the Active Directory database, and it will be replicated to all other domain controllers. 
So now that we are on New York DC1, I'm going to go ahead and click Start and go to Active Directory Users and Computers. If you don't see it here on the Start menu, you would find it under Administrative Tools. Okay, the reason it's here is because I have accessed it recently. If you're following along, you would have accessed it recently as well, and it should be here on your end as well. Okay, so here we are in Active Directory, Users and Computers. And the first thing I want to show you, let me go ahead and expand globalmantics.local, is that there are a number of built-in containers. Okay, ones that are not considered to be organizational units. All right, we have our built-in container called built-in. <laughs> and this is where we have a bunch of built-in security groups. Okay, so there's a number of groups. Let me go ahead and expand this a little bit. There's a number of groups which are here by default as part of the creation of Active Directory. And some of these groups we'll talk about later in this course and some groups we'll talk about in other courses. Well, these groups serve certain specific purposes. Here we have the built-in computers container and this is the default location where a computer account will get created if it has not been specified to put somewhere else. And that's why New York Client 1 ended up here. I'm going to skip through a bunch of the rest of these here and go down here to the users container, which is the default location for all users unless you create additional containers, which we're going to do in just a little bit. So you can see this is where we'll find our administrator account and our guest account, our two user accounts, as well as some additional default security groups. Okay, so the the default security groups are actually divided between the user's container and the built-in container. Now one other container I want to show you, and this is kind of an awkward one, is there is a, a default container, and I'm not calling it built-in, I'm going to call it default container, called domain controllers. And the domain controllers container is where our default domain controller computer accounts go Again, unless we specify otherwise. Now, why am I referring to this container a little bit different? Well, you'll notice there's just a tiny little icon on there in the folder. It's not, it's not blank like these others. Okay, that little icon right there is what represents that this container is indeed an OU. So believe it or not, even though it's there by default, the domain controller's container is an organizational unit. Now I don't want you to get real caught up on this, at least not yet. There are other things that we're going to talk about in future lessons which will have to do with doing things to either an organizational unit or a built-in container, where maybe it's a slight difference depending on whether it's an organizational unit or a built-in container. And you just need to know that the domain controllers container is officially referred to as an organizational unit. Now, if I want to create an additional organizational unit, what I would do is I would right click in the location where I want it. So if I want to create another organizational unit on the top level of this structure, I right click on globalmantics.local. So right click, new organizational unit. And I give it a name. And so this name I'm going to give it is going to be New York. Okay, so I'm going to create a container that is going to be specific for the New York office. Now there is something that is new to Windows Server 2008, which is right here, this little checkbox that says protect container from accidental deletion. This is a really nice feature. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and on a little side note here, let me show you what that feature does. I'm going to click OK. And you'll see that an organizational unit, because it has that little icon, has been created for New York. If I were to highlight this, which it's already highlighted, and I'm going to right click on it and hit delete. Okay, I could have hit delete on the keyboard, but then you wouldn't be able to see me doing it. So I'm going to select delete, and it says, are you sure you want to delete the organization unit named New York? Yes. Uh-oh, I don't have sufficient privileges to delete New York 
or this object is protected from accidental deletion. Click OK. Okay, that makes you have to work a little bit harder to delete this organizational unit. What you'd have to do is right click and go into the properties. And matter of fact, we have to go one step further because none of these tabs are going to help us out. Let me cancel out of here. I would need to go to the view menu and say I want to view advanced features, which you'll notice, by the way, there's a bunch of other built-in containers which were hidden before. Okay, they're considered to be part of advanced features. So we're going to actually make those go away in just a little bit. But for right now, I need those so that when I go into the properties of this container, I have additional property sheets. Okay, so besides general managed by and com plus, we now have object security and attribute editor. Well, the tab I want to show you is object. On the object tab, you'll notice that's where it says protect object from accidental deletion. If I clear that checkbox, then I could go ahead and delete the object. But we don't want to do that. <laughs> so let me go ahead and cancel out of here. And I'm going to go back up here to view and turn off advanced features. Okay, For right now, it's just extra stuff to get in the way. Okay, Nothing that we need to deal with right now. So I just wanted to show you that one little feature about protecting from accidental deletion. Now, if I want to create another organizational unit, but I want to start creating a hierarchy inside of New York, I could right click on that actual container, new organizational unit, and this time say NY users. And again, I will protect it from accidental deletion. Click OK. And you'll see how I have a hierarchy now. Now in New York, I also could right click new organization unit and Y computers. There you go. Now I have a container for the New York office. So for anybody or anything that's in New York, and then I break it down into my users and my computers. Now I could, you might be thinking to yourself, create another organizational unit and call this NY groups. I could do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I will tell you that typically you'll find your groups get put in with your users. Okay. In most organizations, it just ends up working out that way. You don't have to have a separate container for groups. What you end up doing is groups typically end up containing users that are all from the same container. And then in that instance, you just go ahead and make the group part of that container as well. There is no one right way to do this. So I'm going to actually go ahead and leave New York groups for right now. But I just wanted you to know that, well, that's not always how it's done. So when you, when you go out there and look at other companies, Active Directory infrastructures, it is very common to see a users in a computers container. You won't always find this third container. All right, now one thing that I can do right out the right out the gates is I could take the New York client one computer and I could move it into New York computers. And you'll notice I'm just clicking and dragging. And it just warns me that if you move an object, it might have certain effects on that object. Okay, because as I mentioned a little while ago, delegation of administrative control and group policy application are also affected by organizational unit structure. And so therefore, when you move an object from one organizational unit to another, you might be affecting that. But I'm going to say, yep, I know what I'm doing. Go ahead and move it. And now I have my first computer account listed in New York computers. Speaking of computer accounts, if I wanted to create another computer account, so let's say I have a second client that I'm going to be using in New York, I can right click on that container, new computer, NY, CLI2 for client 2, win 7. Click OK. There you go. Now I've got New York Client 2 win, and it's Windows 7.
Now, this computer does not necessarily exist yet, but I'll tell you what. If we were to go over to a client computer named New York Cli2 Win7 and join it to the domain, it will go ahead and associate to this computer account as opposed to showing up in the default computer's container. Okay, so, and we could go ahead and we could continue this. We could just continue to say, all right, let's go ahead and new computer, New York client three, Windows seven. Okay. Now I bet you could probably imagine what a pain that would be trying to create 500 of these. And you know what? It would be. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine. I mean, I don't know if you were timing that, but what would that take me? If, if I'm going really, really fast, maybe I can create one in 10, 15 seconds. And that's if I don't slip up at all. So I could create maybe four, five, six per minute. So let's say if I could do five minutes times 500 machines, that's 100 minutes. I'm going to spend over an hour and a half just creating computer accounts. No, it's not realistic. So there's a couple different ways that we can improve upon this. One would be don't manually create the computer accounts. Go ahead and join the domain. Let all the computer accounts go into the computer's container and then move them all. You'd have a list of 500 computer accounts and move them all to the New York computer's container. Well, that's one way. Another way is we could go ahead and either use a script or one of the mass import utilities to create all the accounts. Okay, so we'll go ahead and 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 we'll see how to do that because I'm going to show you using both the script and the mass import utility. I'm going to show you how to create all 500 user accounts. Okay, and speaking of user accounts, well, here's New York users. If I right click, and by the way, you'll notice there's two choices. I can either right click on the container, new user, or I could right click in the blank area here, once highlighted on the container, and it's the same thing, new user. And to create a user account, we could just go ahead and create test J user and we could say that this is t user right because we're going to go with a user naming convention of first initial last name and you'll notice it's at globalmantics.local there's a drop down but there's no other choices because that's the only domain that we have available and we will learn in a later lesson that without creating additional domains we can create additional suffixes but we'll we'll visit that later click next Assign a password. And then we have some choices here. User must change password at next logon. This is typical. Okay, this is typically what you want to do. You, you want to check that box. You're going to create a generic password. So you might put in there, you know, temp1234 just to create some kind of temporary password. Then you tell the user, all right, I've created a user account for you. It's named TUser. And your password is temp1234. And when that user goes to log on for the very first time, they will be prompted to change their password to something that only they know. Because you want it that way in most environments. Now, there are some environments where you assign a password to a user, and that's their password. And in that case, not only do they not get prompted to change password at next logon, but there's a very good chance you're going to say that the user cannot change their password. And along those same lines, password never expires. Well, that would be if you want to assign a password to a user, or even if you're letting the user pick their own password. Either way, if you want to not have them be forced every X number of days to reset their password to a new one because you may have a policy in place that tells everybody every 30 days you have to select a new password. If there is a particular individual you don't want to have hassled with that, so as a for instance, let's say the CEO of the company says, I don't want to ever change my password. Well, in general, what CEOs want, CEOs get, <laughs> you go ahead and check the box saying password never expires. Now the last checkbox here is account is disabled. This would be if you were 
going through the process of creating user accounts, but those users were not yet starting with the company. Okay, maybe you received a new hire list from the human resources department. Here's a list of 20 employees that we are hiring on the first of next month. Well, then what you might want to do is rather than waiting till the first of next month to go through and create all these accounts, you go ahead and create them now. You check the box saying the account is disabled and you give instructions for all new employees. You make it part of the new employee handbook that in order to log in, the first thing they need to do is call help desk and have their account enabled. And then that way, when the user is actually ready they pick up the phone, they call help desk. You might want to notify help desk that on the first of next month, they're going to get at least 20 phone calls about this and they'll get those 20 phone calls and one at a time as they call in, the account will be enabled. Okay. So typically we want user to change password to next logon next and finish. And we've now created test J user. Okay. That's how you create a user. How about a group? We come in here to groups, right click, new, group. I bet you never would have guessed that that's what you're gonna do. You need to give the group a name. So we might create a group called sales. Okay, so maybe all the users in the sales department will become a member of the sales group. Now, there are different group scopes, domain local, global, and universal. And we're going to actually talk about those different group scopes in a lesson coming up. It's actually a couple lessons from now. But for right now, we're going to go with the global group scope. So you're just going to have to kind of trust me on that. And group type, security versus distribution. And again, we're going to talk about that. We have a lesson coming up a couple lessons from now called managing groups. In that lesson, we will talk about all of this stuff down here on the bottom. But for right now, we're going to leave it with the defaults, global security group, and click OK. Now we have a sales security group. Once we have a bunch of users, we could make the users of the sales department a member of that group. And then we can start assigning permissions to the resources that the sales department needs. Now that's how you would add objects through the Active Directory Users and Computers MMC. But I told you that we were going to also look at a command line utility called dsadd. So let me click start and go to the command prompt. And in the command prompt, there is a tool called dsadd. And I'm going to put slash question mark so that you can see everything that you can do with it. Now you'll notice here that DS add gets followed by computer contact group OU user or quota. Okay. And that's to add a different type of object. Now the four objects in particular that we were just working with were computers, groups, OUs and users. So you see they can all be added with DS add. So as a for instance, let me go ahead and type actually let me type CLS. So I'm going to type in DS add space OU because we're going to add an organizational unit space and we now need to add something called the LDAP distinguished name. This is a unique hierarchical name that all objects have in Active Directory. Now we have to put this in quotes and the reason why is because there may be spaces and or commas. Well, there's definitely going to be commas. And commas and spaces mean something in a command line. So by putting the quotes, it means it's all one entry. Okay, so the unique name for this OU, we're going to say OU equals test OU. Now, if test OU was inside of another OU, I would put comma and then the name of the parent OU. But for right now, we're going to put it right at the root 
of the domain. So what we move to next is something called DC, which does not stand for domain controller. It stands for domain component. And I'm going to put equals globomantics, comma, DC equals local. And I want you to pay really close attention to the fact that I did globomantics, comma, DC equals local. Not DC equals globomantics dot local. That's the big mistake a lot of people make. You have to put a separate domain component for each level of the domain name. Now I'm going to put end quotes and hit enter. And you'll see that it says that it succeeded. Now I'm going to switch back over to Active Directory, Users and Computers. I'm going to highlight globalmantics.local. And I'm going to hit this little icon right here which, which refreshes the screen. You could also hit F5 on the keyboard. When I refresh, you'll see here that it refreshed. We still have everything we had before. We still have New York. We still have the stuff that's inside New York. But we also now have an organizational unit called Test OU. Now I'm going to go ahead and right click and delete that OU. Notice it deleted because there was no protection put in. That, that protection comes when you create it through the GUI. Because I want to show you if I come back over here and do that DS add command once again. This time, by the way, all I did was hit up arrow to make this command repeat itself. Okay, to repeat the previous command, you just hit up arrow. I'm going to put this inside the hierarchy. I'm going to put OU equals test OU, comma, OU equals NY space users, comma. Now, because I put it there, I want to show you what happens. If I hit enter, it's going to fail. And the reason why is because it's not going to find that location. If I'm going to put it inside, New York users, well, New York users resides inside another OU called New York. So you have to put the entire hierarchy. And it goes from, and this gets a little confusing, the child most level working up towards the parent. And here's what gets confusing about it. When you get to the domain components, you have to put the entire hierarchy. So we have OU equals test OU, OU equals New York users, then the parent of that is OU equals New York. So if I hit enter, DS add succeeded. And if I come back over here to Active Directory users and computers, refresh the screen again, you'll notice that inside of New York, inside of New York users, we have test OU. Now, again, we don't need that. So let me go ahead and delete that. Yes, I'm sure. Go back over to the command prompt. That's how you add an OU. Well, let's say we want to do something a little more fancy. Let's say I wanted to DS add space user. Okay, now we're going to add a user account. Well, there's a few different things that we may want to do here. The first thing is, well, we need the LDAP distinguished name, and it's a little bit different. A user account has a CN, a common name, which will equal, we'll say, J Smith. Then we have to say, where does J Smith exist? So I'm going to put comma, OU equals New York users comma, OU equals New York. Now, you have to put the OU structure. You can't put a user at the root of the domain structure. Okay, a user has to go into a container. But at this point, now that we have the container, I have to put comma, DC equals globomantics, comma, DC equals local end quotes. Now that's one thing that's different is that the location, you have to put it inside of an OU. So you have your CN, the actual name of the user, and then the container you're going to put it in. But then you can put in additional information. And I'll tell you what, here are probably the most common 
pieces that you want to put in. You want to put in something called the SAM ID, which is your pre Windows 2000 logon name. Okay, instead of having a name at globalmantics.local, if you want to just have an old generic logon name, okay, I'm going to put in J Smith. That's what the SAM ID is. And then how about this one? This one's really important for a user. PWD for password. And then we put in the actual password. So we'll put in temp1234. And then since we did a temporary password, must change password, yes. So I'm going to hit enter and you'll see that it says it added a user. Come back over here to Active Directory Users and Computers and I will highlight uh, New York users and hit refresh and you'll see that J Smith has now been added. If I go into J Smith, here is that right here that pre Windows 2000 logon name and here's the checkbox saying user must change password at next logon. I can't show you the password anywhere because obviously passwords are always hidden. But if I were to go try to log in as J Smith, I would have to go ahead and put in that password, temp1234. I want to show you how you can really put DSAD to use. I'm going to go ahead and highlight both of these users. I held down the shift key, by the way, to highlight both users. And then I want to go ahead and delete these users because those users don't actually exist in Globomantics. But there are 500 other users which exist in the Global Mantics network. So I want to show you. I'm going to click on Start and go to Computer. On my C drive, I have a batch file. Okay, This is a Windows batch file. All it really is is a text document that has the file extension BAT. Now you can't see that extension because in Windows Explorer, I have known file extensions hidden. So actually, let me change that. I'm going to hit Alt to make the menu show up. I'm going to click View. I'm sorry, Tools. Go to Folder Options. Go to View. And then I'm going to say to not hide extensions for known file types. Click OK. And you'll see that this file is actually called create500users.bat. Now I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to select edit. Okay, we don't want to run it yet. We want to edit it. And it just opens up in Notepad. So let me expand this all the way. And I want to show you that all this text document is, is a list of 500 DSAD commands. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's great, Ed, but you had to type in 500 DSAD commands. Um, no, I didn't. I don't want to go too overboard with this because this is not a scripting class, but I will tell you that all I did was I used Microsoft Excel, so I had a spreadsheet of usernames. Okay, it's not that hard to get all of the names of your users into a spreadsheet. Very often you'll have those in a spreadsheet for a multitude of other reasons and other things you do in your company. And if you have all these users in a spreadsheet, you can then, through a little bit of Excel magic, you can go ahead and auto-populate these lines. Now I want to show you that for each of these lines, I have DSAD. It's a user that we're adding. I have the LDAP distinguished name. And to be specific, it ends up being common name is first initial, last name. OU is New York users, comma, OU, New York, DC, Global Mantics, DC, local. Okay, so we're across the board here using pretty much the same LDAP distinguished name that I used in the individual example. We want to make everybody part of New York users. Now, here's a couple extra switches that I didn't show you before, which is first name and last name. Okay, so instead of just A Izari, we have Adam is, actually, I pronounce it Irizari. We have password and then a super secret password, a super complicated password, I should say. Must change password is yes. 
and we've decided that the SAM ID is not necessary. I wanted to show you that one because if you are working in a mixed environment, it really is necessary. But because we're Windows 2008 only, it's not necessary, so I didn't worry about it here. And we have that same line all the way down for 500 users. So I'm going to go ahead and close this, and I'm going to double click on this file and watch this. A command prompt window opens, and it's showing me that it is adding these 500 users. Now let me actually grab hold of the scroll bar here and scroll up, and I'm holding it in place. If I let go, it'll start scrolling again. I just want to hold it in place so that you can look to see that the line is just being put right into a command prompt, and then it's telling me that the DS ad succeeded. So I'm going to let go, and we're going to go ahead and just let this continue. And in just a few moments here, it will be done adding 500 users. While we're waiting, I'm going to pop back over here to Active Directory Users and Computers and show you on New York Users, if I refresh, boom, we've got a bunch of users. Look at that. Okay, and matter of fact, if I were to just keep hitting refresh, look over here at the scroll bar. You'll notice it's getting smaller and smaller each time I hit refresh. And the reason why it's getting smaller is because there's more and more users being added in. Okay, so you can use simple batch file scripts to get a lot of users added all at once. Now, one thing I will tell you as well is if you want to follow along, you're thinking, well, okay, great. I would like to have the 500 users on my system as well. I have included in the exercise files with this course this particular batch file. So if you want, just go to the exercise files, bring this batch file over to your domain controller and double click on it, just like I did. So let's go ahead and switch back over to our command prompt and we want to go to, I believe it's this one. Nope, wrong one. This one right here. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording of this lesson while we wait for the rest of the 500 users to populate and then I will resume. Okay, so the creation of the 500 users has completed. The command prompt window which was representing that creation is gone. And if we come over here, we'll see, we refresh, we'll see that we have 500 users now. Woo, big list. All right, now there is one last thing that I wanna show you before we move on. Let me go back to the command prompt window. And what that is, is there, there's one real common thing that's done, and it's, 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 it's kind of a common mistake that is made. And that is, if we were to come back here to adding our user, John Smith, let me, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead, let's get rid of all this. We don't need that. Let's go ahead and create a user. Wait, I don't want to do another John Smith because we already have that. So let's do J Doe. And instead of putting it in the New York users container, we want to go ahead and put it in the users container. Okay, so now we're trying to create another user account. Here's a name in the users container inside globalmantics.local. Now if I hit enter, watch what happens. It fails. And the reason why is it says object not found. And the reason it's not found, if we come back over here, you remember how I told you that users is not an organizational unit, it's a built-in container, and it has some different rules when something is an organizational unit versus a built-in container? Well, that's true with the LDAP distinguished name. The users container is not considered to be an organizational unit. It's built in, so it just has a CN. It has a common name. So we have common name J Doe in common name users in globalmantics.local. And if I hit enter, DS ad succeeded. If I come back over here, look in the users container, you'll see I have J Doe. Well, let me go ahead and delete J Doe. We don't need that user account. But I just wanted to show you 
that the built-in containers have an LDAP distinguish notation of CN, not OU. If I wanted to add a user to the domain controllers, or we'll say any object, because obviously it would be a computer account you would want to add. But if I wanted to add a computer account to the domain controllers container, that is an organizational unit. Matter of fact, just to show you again, it is an organizational unit. Okay, so that's why I want you to keep that in mind, is because certain things will act in different ways. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the mass import utilities. And really, it's import export utilities. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the command prompt. And I'm going to type CLS again. This just clears out the screen, get rid of everything that we're currently looking at. And I want to first show you something called CSVDE. This is an import export utility that works with what's called comma delimited files. These are just text documents that use commas to separate certain columns or indicators or attributes really would be the the most correct term the different attributes. Now if I do CSVDE and I do slash question mark you'll see that there are a bunch of things that we can do with this. Okay, there's a bunch of different switches and parameters. The one that I want to show you, let me go ahead and clear the screen, is I'm going to do, first of all, just generically, CSVDE space, and I'm going to do dash F for file, meaning this is the file that we're going to work with, and I'm going to put just C colon backslash CSVDE dot CSV. And if I hit enter, that's all I need. It's going to go ahead and it goes to the database. And by default, it's an export utility. There's a switch, which is dash I, which we use to make it an import utility. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and just use the utility as an export utility. And that's what it did. It went ahead and took basically every single object in Active Directory, of which there are 735 of them right now, and it exported them out to a comma separated file. Now, if we want to see that file, let's go ahead and click start, computer, go to the C drive, and here's a file called csvde.csv. I'm going to go ahead and right click, and I want to open it, but it's not going to know how, so I'm going to say select a program from a list, click OK. And I want to use Notepad, and I don't always want to use the selected program to open this file. By the way, if for some reason Notepad wasn't there as an option, it should be, but if it wasn't, then you expand other programs and you should find Notepad down there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Uh, I could say I do always want to use Notepad to open this kind of file, but then that would associate all CSV files with Notepad. And you know what, I don't know that I want that, because as a, for instance, comma separated files very often you would open with a spreadsheet like Microsoft Excel or maybe a database. So I'm going to leave that blank right now. Click OK. And this is what the file looks like. A bunch of gibberish. Believe it or not, it's not complete gibberish. What we have here is a top line, which is significant. This very first line is significant. This is the header. And you'll notice it's a very, very long header right now. And the reason why is because it's showing every single attribute from every single object. Okay, so if I scroll back over here, let's see if we can recognize some of these. We have DN, which represents distinguished name. Object class, which is the type of object that we are working with. So if it's a user object, the object class would be user. If it's a computer object, it would be computer. Distinguished name. Instance type when created, you know what? A lot of these you don't need to know what they are, and and it's really it's not significant. You don't have to be an absolute master of every single object or attribute name. So let me go ahead and close this, and let's work with something that's eh, just a little bit more usable. And that is, if I were to go ahead and do my command again, csvde dash f, 
And I'm going to use the same file. You're going to find this to be really, really interesting and dangerous all at the same time. I'm going to actually point to exporting to the exact same file. But this time, I'm going to go ahead and put space dash L. And then I'm going to say I want DN for distinguished name, comma, object class. Right? I want to know what kind of object it is comma, Sam account name. By the way, you'll notice the capitalization of certain characters. That is very, very important. Okay, so you'll need to go out. If you are ever going to play with this, you're going to want to go out and look up the actual attribute names, comma. Now check this out. I'm going to put in SN, which stands for surname, comma, given name and it, instead of putting dash fn dash ln for first name last name like we had with the ds add utility now we have the actual official attribute name which is the surname or sn and given name okay so the sn is taking the place of last name and given name is taking place of the first name comma We'll put in the user principal name. Now we could go on and on and I could keep putting different attributes, but basically I want to show you what happens here. I'm going to hit enter. Notice it again exported to a file, 735 entries. But when I come over to the file, and this time I'm, when I go ahead and go to open it, select program, notepad, but not always. Notice it's not quite as much gibberish. It's a little bit easier to read. We have the distinguished name, the object class, the SAM account name, surname, given name. And apparently when I typed in, let me take a look here. When I typed in user principal name, I must have typed it in wrong because that's what it does is if you capitalize it or spell the name, the actual attribute name wrong, well, then it just doesn't even come over. So anyway, let's not worry about that. The main point I want to show you is that this is what we have. And then here is the actual distinguished name. Actually, let's go down to, to one that, you know, way down here that has everything. Um, uh, let's see if we can find one. Well, you know what? This is going to be really hard. You know why this is going to be so hard? Because there's so much stuff. So let's do one more thing. Let's close this before we examine it. Let's pop back over here to our command prompt window. I'm going to add one more thing to this tool. I'm going to go ahead and bring up that same command, space, dash, r, space. And now I'm going to put in object class equals user. What dash R does is dash R makes it that we are filtering to a certain scope of what we're going to export. So if I hit enter, this time you'll notice it only exported 507 entries. Not sure why it's 507 because I only have 500 users and then of course there's administrator and there is guests. And I thought I got rid of everybody else. But let's go in and take a look at it. You'll notice, by the way, it's the same file that keeps getting used. There is no warning like this file already exists. Are you sure you want to override it? That's why it's kind of cool, but then scary at the same time. All right, so what do we have here? DN. The, here's our actual distinguished name. Administrator in the users container in globalmantics.local. Object class, it's a user. Sam account name, administrator. Now you notice for surname and given name, well, they're just blank. They don't exist. We didn't give a surname or a given name to the built-in administrator account. That was just there by default. If I were to pop down here, let's just pick a name at random. Here we have the distinguished name. Here we have the object class. Here we have the Sam account name, A. Perry. And then here we have the surname or last name, Perry. 
and then the given name or first name, Amy. And if I scroll down, you'll see that there are, well, I was going to say 500, but apparently 507 of these users. I'm not really going to worry about why there's 507, um, but there is. Okay. So that's how we can use this tool to export. But what about using this tool for import? Well, if I want to import, all I have to do is say CSVDE dash I for import dash F and then the name and location of the file. CSVDE dot CSV. Now, if I hit enter, watch what happens. It's not going to work. And the reason is because if you go through and read all this, it says an error occurred already exists. An error on line two already exists. By the way, you really want to pay close attention to this because this tells you exactly, it doesn't always tell you the exact error, but it tells you what, where to find the error. So if I were to go to line two in this file, you'll see that basically what it's saying is, oh, this guy already exists. So I have an idea. How about I delete administrator? Let's delete guest. Um, this is kind of interesting. It's including a computer account, even though it's not a user object class. I'm not sure why I did that. Um, it looks like here's our extra seven, by the way. So let's get rid of these seven. I'm just going to delete those right out of the file. And now I should be left with only the 500 users that were in the New York users container. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and save it. Then I'm going to go back over here to Active Directory Users and Computers. I'm going to go into New York Users. I'm going to highlight one and I'm going to hit Control A, which is Select All. And I'm going to hit Delete. Are you sure? Oh, hey, now there's only 498. Okay, not sure why, but I'll just go ahead and say yes. Let's get rid of all 498 objects. I'm guessing that when I did my DS add command for the 500 names, um, there must have been an error with two of them. And by the way, everything you're witnessing right now is exactly why, you know, we very often will just do things directly through <laughs> the GUI interface. It's because when you start dealing with scripts and you start dealing with bulk import and stuff like that well there's a lot of little you know tweaks and stuff that go along with it but here's what i will tell you once you get all those little tweaks worked out it's really powerful i mean let's be real even if i created this batch file that i did that's supposed to create 500 users and it only created 498 of them well it's not going to take much to figure out which two were missing i mean as soon as you end up with two people who call in and say yeah, I don't, I'm not able to log in. Or as soon as somebody calls into help desk on that first day of work and, and, and that help desk person says, uh, your account doesn't exist. Are you sure you work here? Okay, you're going to figure out who those two people are. All right, so not that big a deal. But anyway, we've now deleted all 500 of those users. So I'm going to come back over to the command prompt and I'm going to just hit up arrow to just run our CSVDE import command again and this time you'll notice that it's going through a bunch of little dots uh oh error on line 499 already exists so 497 <laughs> entries were created very interesting so let's do two things one let's go back over to the file i'm just curious we gotta look at this if i go down to line 499 which i'm guessing is the last line Oh, Jay Smith. Apparently, Jay Smith, I think, got created somewhere else. And so it's getting mad because you can't have this name twice. So if I were to guess, I think Jay Smith got created twice. So we're not going to worry about Jay Smith. Okay, we'll go in and manually add that in later if we need to. What I do want to do is pop over to Active Directory and I want to hit Refresh. Hey, look at that. We got our users back. All right, so that's how CSVDE can help export and or import objects. 
Now there's another mass import export utility. It's called LDFT. So what I want to do is let me go ahead and go back to the command prompt. Let's clear out of here. And I want you to see that the command works very, very similarly. It just works with a different type of file. So I'm going to type LDIFDE space file C colon backslash LDFD dot LDF and hit enter. And again, by default, it's an export utility. So you'll see that 733 entries exported. Uh-oh, we lost two along the way. Uh, I think it was those two that we were playing with, Jay Smith. I think it might even be both Jay Smiths. Maybe they was in there twice and somehow they got deleted. But anyway, let's not worry about that. What I want to show you is, boom, I have a file here called LDFD LDF. And if I go to open it, you got to select the program. Here's Notepad. Again, if it doesn't open by default, and in this case, I don't think it does. Uh, it, it chooses, it tries to go to Internet Explorer, so be careful. You want to expand to other programs and then select Notepad. It appeared on mine because I have actually done this on this computer before. Okay, so that's why it was there. So in case you run into that, make sure you do that. I'm going to click OK. And this is what it looks like. Crazy garbledy gook. <laughs> well, here's how the crazy garbledy gook works. Basically, instead of having a, a title line at the top that establishes how all of the other lines are going to look, these are line items. Here's the distinguished name. It's going to be an add. Here's different object classes, distinguished name, instance type, etc., etc., etc. If I scroll all the way down to right there, when you find a space, when you find that space, everything I just scrolled through was for one object. All of this is for another object. All of this is for another object. So as you can see, some objects have more space than others. So let's go ahead and close this. Let's come back over to our command prompt. And just like we did with CSVDE, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this guy where we did CSVDE and we did only certain attributes. But guess what? All I'm going to do is use the exact same command, but this time I'm going to put in ldfd.ldf and change this command to ldfd. It's the exact same command, exact same syntax. Hit enter. Again, it exported 733 entries, but this time A little bit easier to read, okay? We only have a few different attributes that we care about, okay? And some will have more than others just because we designed this particular set of attributes based upon users, and not all things are users, so they may not have everything. So why don't we take this the rest of the way? And let's go to our CSVDE command, where we not only were exporting only certain attributes, but then we went ahead and said only users. Okay, so again, let me scroll back here. We're going to have this same command, but we're going to put in a different file, ldfd.ldf. And the command is ldfd. Hit enter. Notice, by the way, again, it goes only to that same specific file and overwrites it without warning us. Now we went to 506 entries. Again, I'm not really sure what's going on here as far as why we're getting those extra six, seven, eight entries. But let's go in and look. It may actually show a little bit more clearly in, in an LDFT file. So let's see here. Um, well, here's the administrator account. And here's guest. Now here is New York DC1. And I think the reason why is because this, for whatever reason, is being listed in the database as being both a computer and a user. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I'm not enough of a database administrator and programmer to know why that happens, um, but I'm not gonna worry about it. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and take the administrator account and the guest account 
and the uh, domain controller, whatever this is, this looks like Kerberos ticket granting ticket, I think is what that stands for. Uh, well, that's something we'll talk about later on in the course. Uh, here we have New York DC2. Here we have, oh, there's our client computer. There's an, another client computer, uh, another client computer. Hopefully that's the last one. Ah, and there we get to Jay Smith. So let's go ahead and delete all these. And now, hopefully, let's see if we have two Jay Smiths. Let me scroll down to the bottom. Nope, apparently it put Jay Smith at the top this time for some reason. So now all we have is these objects. And you'll notice that we are going to add these objects. So I'm going to close, save. If I come over here, if I now do... Let's see here, if I do LDIFT and point to that file, but this time make it a dash I for import, what's gonna happen? That's right, it's gonna fail. And the reason it's gonna fail is because again, add error on entry starting at line one already exists. Yes, all of these accounts already exist. So we would need to come back here to Active Directory we would need to highlight all of these, control A, and delete. Or am I sure I wanna delete these objects? Yes, I wanna delete these objects. And I'll tell you what, while it is deleting these objects, I wanna show you something. If I were to come over here and do LDIFT slash question mark, let's look at all the different switches here, because there's one specific switch I wanna show you. And that's right here, dash K. When you're doing an import, dash K, the import will go on ignoring constraint violation and object already exist errors. And I also want to show you that if I type in CSVDE slash question mark, and again, scroll up a little bit here, dash K, the object will go on ignoring constraint violation and object already exist errors. If you don't put that dash K, then what's going to happen is, let's say all of the objects didn't already exist. Let's say just J. Smith exists. Well, it's going to air out anyway because the one object exists. Whereas if only that one already exists, it would skip over that one error and add everybody else. So let's go ahead and put in our LDIFT import and see what happens. Hit enter, and you'll notice that. There you go. Now, the reason, by the way, we didn't get an error with J. Smith is because we got the error with the CSVDE file because J. Smith was added twice. It was added once legit, and the second time it was an error. Now, there was only one J. Smith. Everything worked fine. And if notice that we're back to 498 entries. If I come back over here to Active Directory, refresh, everybody has returned. All right. So... That's how you can use LDIFT to export and import Active Directory objects. Now, here's the thing I'm going to tell you. If you were going to try to work with CSVDE or LDIFT just to import a whole bunch of stuff, it's not fun. It's not easy. It ends up almost, in some cases, being as much work as if I just right-click New User again and again and again. I mean, at that point, I would prefer to create a batch file manually with DSAD. But let's say you were doing some form of a migration from one Active Directory domain to another. So as a for instance, let's say you were going to go ahead and have two companies who have merged together. One, bump, one company has bought out another company. And they each had their own Active Directory database. And you want to merge them into a single Active Directory domain. Well, all the users from the other domain, you would want to go ahead and export. And then once you have exported them from that domain, what you would want to do is go into the file. So we could say like the CSVDE file. And what I could do here is I could go ahead and everything is globomantics.local. Well, let's say that globomantics just got bought out by trainsignal.local. 
All I would have to do is go up here to edit, replace, type in Globomantics. And if I want to be more specific, I might say anywhere you find DC equals Globomantics and change that to DC equals train signal. And you'll see if I go to find next, it finds it. And if I say replace, it replaces it and then goes on to the next one, replace, replace. Or I could even just go, boom, replace all. And with one flash, look at that. Now everybody is part of trainsignal.local. And then I could go ahead and import them into the train signal Active Directory domain. Okay, so that is where CSVDE and LDIFTY really can come in handy when, it, when you're dealing with an export and then an import. So let me close this. No, I don't want to save that because, well, there is no train signal.local domain here, just globalmantics.local. All right, so that's pretty much how you add stuff to Active Directory. Okie dokie, that brings us to the end of this lesson. And what have we covered? Well, we started off talking a little bit about global mantics. And I mean, let's be real. What was the need here? Well, we created Active Directory. We created a domain. Well, without stuff, it doesn't do anything. So we had to go ahead and add objects for our users and computers and things like that. I reviewed what an organizational unit is. It's, again, remember, it's, it's a container. Okay, it's real, real simple. It's what it is. Talked about users, which represent people. Groups, which represent a bunch of people who we're going to give similar access to similar resources. And computer objects, which represent, well, physical computers. Then we went in and added a whole bunch of stuff into Active Directory. I showed you how to do it manually through the GUI, through the MMC, through Active Directory, users and computers, which is basically... You know, it's pretty intuitive. You point to where you want to add something. You right-click, select New, and then pick the object you want to add. I showed you how to do it from the command prompt using DS Add. I showed you how to take DS Add and put it into a script. And then finally, showed you the mass import export utilities, CSVDE and LDIFTY. So that's pretty much everything I have for you in this lesson. I will see you in the next one.